to get it up there as quickly as I can. And then before Brother Josh comes to lead us, I have a message to convey to you from uh, Mary Ann Clark. Uh, Mary Ann's mom passed away last week. We have some little brochures out there, memorial brochures on the table. And she wants to convey to this congregation her thanks uh, for all of the prayers and all of the ministry that everyone has done uh, for them and for their family. So remember Mary Ann, her mom, I think her mom was 96, 97 years old, something like that. It's, it's on the brochure. So please remember uh, them uh, in, in prayer. All right, Brother Josh. Good morning, everybody. And real quick, just a quick technical thing. Hey, Todd or Ken or somebody that's up there, I think this mic is a little bit hot. We're getting a lot of some feedback in the house, so I just wanted to tell you all. I think it's, this one's a little bit hot. It might just be the monitor. Sorry, that was a technical thing. If you would all stand up with us, good morning again to you. And we're going to sing uh, number 263, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. <clears throat> I, uh, I picked these hymns today thinking about all that's going on in our world. The Lord is able to overcome all of these things. He's a shelter through everything. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary A shelter in the time of storm a shade by day defense by night a shelter in the time of storm no fears alarm no foes of fright a shelter in the time of storm oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land a weary A shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat. A shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land. A weary land. shelter in the time of storm oh rock divine oh refuge dear a shelter in the time of storm be thou our helper ever near a shelter in the time of storm oh jesus is a rock in a weary land a weary Wonderful to remember things like that in times uh, like these, right? Let's see, what's the number of our next one, Miss Sue? 264. If y'all want, if you want to use your hymnal, you can. You, I know you know it though. In the garden, uh, I know a lot of you love this hymn, and and all this craziness that's going on everywhere. We also need to remember that uh, the Lord speaks peace to us uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can have peace in the midst of all these crazy things um, in him and it, it can be on this earth it can even be like a garden with the Lord resting in him so good to remember I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks. 
and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden we tarry there, none other has ever known. Amen. Can the Lord's people say amen to that? Amen. That, and that good news that no matter where we are, no matter who you are, <clears throat> or in what situation you're in, even all these rioters out in the streets, we can come to the Lord Jesus Christ and find peace constantly in Him. Y'all may be seated. Before the pastor comes up, he just wanted me to welcome everyone this morning again, and we thank you for you being here, and we pray that you'll be blessed by the word that we preach today. Uh, we also want to remind you that if uh, we are have a we won't be passing the collection plate uh, we have a box out on the foyer and on the table you can just drop your gift in there if you'd like all right pastor well good to see all of you today i heard uh about a church was praying for a one-handed preacher did you hear about that Praying for a one-handed preacher. They had a meeting, you know, and they were looking for a pastor. And uh, they called on Brother Johnson back here to pray, you know. And Brother Johnson, everybody bowed his head, and Brother Johnson said, Lord, we, we want to ask you to send us a one-handed preacher. And, uh, of course, he went on, <laughs> prayed about that. And then when he got through, somebody came up to him and said, What in the world? What are you doing praying for a one-handed preacher? He said, Well, I'm tired of hearing these fellows get up in the pulpit and say, the Bible says, but on the other hand, so I said, I want a, I want a one-handed preacher. Well, I've got two hands, but I'm going to try to stand on, <laughs> on the scripture. Good to see all of you today, and again, we want to welcome those of you who are tuning in by the internet, and uh, we're going to have a good lesson today from God's Word. Lynn and I are going to try to sing a little song. It's really two songs. It's a song called Each Step I Take and a song called Until Then. And they will ask you to help us out. <laughs> That's a little low. <laughs> I'll raise it up for him, Sue. <laughs> That's a little 
Is that too low? A. <laughs> that I'm low? sorry, guys. Is that A? No, A. Give me an A. Each, okay, okay, I'll try to hit it. Each step I take, the Savior goes before me. And with his loving hand, he leads the way. And with each breath, I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, the Savior goes before me. And with his loving hand, he leads the way. With each breath, I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, the Savior goes before me. And with his loving hand, he leads the way. breath, I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. But until then, my heart will go on beating. Until then, with, with joy, joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city, until the day God calls me home. My heart can sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is just a stepping stone. Along the road that's leading always upward. This troubled world is not my final home. But until then, my heart will go on beating. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city, until the day God calls me home, until the day God calls me home. All right, well, here's one you can help us with. Stand up, and let's sing Deeper Than the Stain. Let's sing that. I know y'all all know these words. So we're going to do that together. All of deeper you can Deeper than the out stain. Here. The blood goes deeper than the stain ever appears to go in any way. And I'm thankful. <laughs> Dark the stain that soiled man's nature. Sing with me. Long the distance that he fell. Far removed from hope in heaven, from hope in heaven, into deep, into deep despair and hell, despair and hell. But there Here's was a home. fountain open. But there was a fountain open, and the blood of God's own Son, and the blood of God's own Son. Amen. Purifies the soul and reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Sing, Bill. Conscious of that deep pollution. 
sinners wander in the night even though the shepherds calling till they fear to face the light here's a tender consolation that should melt any heart of stone this sweet balm of Gilead reaches deeper than the stain has gone praise the Lord for full salvation God still reigns upon the throne. And I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. When with holy throngs we're standing, of the King, and our souls are lost in wonder, as a white rope choir sings, then we'll praise the name of Jesus, with the millions around the throne. Praise him for <laughs> the power that reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Take a big Here breath you. now. Praise the Lord for full salvation. God still reigns upon the throne. blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone praise the lord for full salvation god still reigns upon the throne and i know the blood still Deeper than the stain has gone. And I know, and I know, the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Amen. Amen. You Thank may be you, seated. Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, we're going to ask the Lord to help us out here. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know If thou withdraw thyself from me I will shout 
remain standing for just a moment, let me read the scripture to you from the book of James, and then I'd like to ask you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Book of James chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into the King James Version says divers, various temptations, challenges, challenges that come to you especially because you're a Christian, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, that is, mature, and entire, that is, complete, wanting, that is, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. Now Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word, and let God's people say, Praise the Lord. And you may be seated. Thank you for sticking with us during this coronavirus time. You can tell that we still haven't gotten used to this schedule, but we're going to catch up, God willing. I think we're doing a little better, just taking us a while. Now let me tell you this, so you'll have this if you have your Bible with you. We're going to end up looking to Hebrews 11, Romans 1, and John's Gospel, chapter 1. So I want you to know where we're going if you have a Bible and you want to follow along. Some of these things will be on our screen, but many of them will not be. Now James says that you ought to count it all joy when you fall into all kinds of challenges. James is not crazy. But being taught by the Lord, he knows that there are blessings in every trial, blessings which are hidden from the world, but they are revealed to those who are trusting the Lord, walking with him by faith. I remind you that Abraham did not know what the Lord had planned for him when he told him to take his only son Isaac and offer him up for a burnt sacrifice. But as he believed God and walked obediently with him, it was revealed to him. Joseph did not know what the Lord had planned for him when he was sold by his own brothers, betrayed by his master's wife, thrown into prison, forgotten by the cupbearer who was in prison with him. But when he was made prime minister of Egypt, it began to dawn on him. And as it was with Abraham and Joseph and Isaac and Jacob and Paul and Peter, so shall it be with you and me if we trust the Lord and walk with him. The Lord has a way of mixing things up. I told you earlier about a prayer meeting. Well, I heard about another prayer meeting. Called on this man to pray. And he began with, Lord, do you know how I hate Lord? I don't like Lord. And people start opening their eyes. What in the world is he talking about? I don't like Lord. He said, I, I don't care, Lord, I don't care for flour either. Don't like it. Not that fond of eggs, but oh how I love those biscuits when they're all mixed up. When they're all mixed up in there together in the right way and the right ingredients, they make those wonderful biscuits that I love. And Lord, he said, we don't understand what you're doing in our lives. We don't understand how you're mixing up this and you're mixing up that and you let this come in, you let that come out, you take this in, you take that out. And we stumble here and we stumble there and we fall backwards half the time. 
But he said, I know it's going to work out for our good. I know it's going to work out for our good and for, our, for your glory. And we just want to learn to trust him. Now, as we've learned in the Bible, and this is all from Deuteronomy 29, 29, the God of the Bible is a God of secrets. There are secrets behind all things having to do with God. Now, who can name something in the universe created by God, a universe created by God? Who can name something in this universe created by God Almighty that has no relationship to it? Now, I think I know what folks mean when they say about something that seems extraordinary to them. They say this. I hear this more and more. It's a God thing. And my friends, everything is a God thing because everything has to do with God in a universe created by Him. You cannot come into existence without Him. You cannot live without Him. You cannot die without Him. You cannot be a success without Him. You can't even fail without Him. A hair cannot fall from your head. A sparrow cannot come to the ground without Him. This is His world and everything in it is a God thing. All the believers in the Bible, if you'll read the Bible from this perspective, all of the believers in the Bible see this world and everything in it, including every event, as a God thing. Now I want you to listen to Hannah, the mother of Samuel, the chief of all the prophets, from 1 Samuel. This is what it says. It says, the Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. There it is on the screen for you. The Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. He brings down to the grave, and he brings up. The Lord makes poor, and the Lord makes rich. He brings low, and he lifts up. He raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifts up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Sounds to me like Samuel's mother believed that everything in this world is a God thing. Now in Deuteronomy, if you're not in Deuteronomy, I'd like you to turn over there for just a moment. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and that verse that I keep referring to is chapter 29, verse 29, but I want you to look at chapter 31 for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 31. This is part of what's called the Song of Moses in which he sets forth the perfections of God. And in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and in verse 30, Deuteronomy 31, and in verse 30, Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation in Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Until they were ended. Then you notice in the next chapter, chapter 32, if you look at verse 44, chapter 32, Deuteronomy, verse 44, Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people, he and Hoshea, that's Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, I want you to look at verse 39. Verse 39 of chapter 32. Now, this is part of Moses' song, praising the Lord for his perfection. Look what he says. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Now that's the God with whom we have to do. Some of you, we have several people here 
who are really walking miracles. They were near death, and the Lord brought them back. Linda Foster is one of them. And uh, Mary Hatton is another one. And Jennifer, who's here with us today, is another one. The Lord is the one who raises us up. I thank the Lord every day when I pray for all of my healings with an S on it because I've been sick many times in my life, and even if you just get a cold and you get well, guess why? <laughs> well, the Lord raises you up. The Lord brings you, brings you back up. Now, when you have time, read this entire song of Moses for yourself. But these verses, 39 and 40, are they are tough, but they can be received by faith. So in chapter 29, which we have settled down upon for the last couple of weeks, and in verse 29, Moses tells the children of Israel that the secret things belong to the Lord our God. And I taught you last week that the existence of God is a secret. The only answer to where did God come from is it's a secret. The person of God is a secret. There's but one God, but in three divine persons. There's no adequate word or term known to human beings by which the person who is the cause and sustainer of all things, that is God, can be described. He can't be described. He's indescribable. The name of God is a secret. I pointed out to you that every time someone asked the Lord what his name was, he denied them that. I pointed out to you that the name of God, which the theologians call a tetragrammaton, is composed of four letters and they're all consonants. There's no vowels in there. It can't be pronounced. The name of God cannot be pronounced. The name of God is a secret. The best men can do is to associate God with an action or location. For example, when the Lord told Abraham to spare Isaac and offer a ram in his stead, Abraham called that place the Lord provides. Jehovah Jireh, we say. That's in Genesis chapter 22. When Jacob met God on his way to Mesopotamia, he laid his head upon a rock, and there he saw this ladder. We call it Jacob's Ladder, one end in heaven, one end on the earth. He named that place the house of God, Bethel, Bethel. When Hagar, the Egyptian maid of Sarah, who was the wife of Abraham, when she was treated so cruelly by Sarah that she had to run into the wilderness, the Lord called her, and the Lord told her to go back to Sarah, and he promised that he would bless her son. And Hagar called that place where God spoke to her, Thou God seest me. We would say it this way, the God who sees. The name of God is the secret. God himself is the secret. We read in Acts chapter 17 that he's not far from every one of us, but he cannot be found out by searching. In him we live and move and have our being, but you can't find him. Even the gospel, I pointed out to you, was a secret until it was revealed. And the gospel is still a, a, a mystery to many, many people. Now, I want you to notice the emphasis in Deuteronomy 29, 29 for today's study. Last week was on God as a God of secrets. This week, I want to talk to you about everything being a God thing. The secret things belong to to the Lord our God. There are three things I'd like to point out to you immediately. Number one, secret things are a God thing. That is, they belong to Him. They find their place with Him. There's no use in you burning the midnight oil trying to figure out the secret things of the Lord. They don't belong to you. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. They're at home there. They're in their natural, supernatural place there. Second thing, the secret behind God's secret things has never been revealed to men and never shall be. Now, why doesn't the Lord reveal all of his secrets? 
I'll give you two or three things to think about. First, if the secret things of the Lord could be figured out or understood, of course, they wouldn't be secret. And much of the awe and the reverence for the Lord is grounded in his secret things. I know all of you, you're even, even some of the youngest here remember Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley was managed by a fellow named Tom Sanders. And you know one thing Tom Sanders wouldn't do with Elvis Presley? Until many, many years passed, he'd never let him have an interview. He wouldn't let him do a spot on television. He wouldn't let him, the only time you saw Elvis Presley is if you paid to go see him at a concert. And what happened was there grew up a mystique about Elvis Presley, a mystery type thing about Elvis Presley. And of course, you know, he became the king of rock and roll, so-called. Well, God Almighty is to be reverence. He's to be had in reverence of all those that are about him. That's what the Lord says in David in the song. And so he doesn't reveal everything. He doesn't reveal all of his mind. He has some secret things that he doesn't reveal, and he doesn't reveal them because he's to be reverenced. He's to be had in awe. And if he revealed everything like we want him to, we wouldn't think anything much about it. You remember what Benjamin Franklin said? Benjamin Franklin said the only way two people can keep a secret is if one of them is dead. Well, we can't keep secrets, and the Lord isn't going anywhere, and so he keeps his secrets secret. And then in the second place, if men could know the secrets of God, then men would think of themselves as little gods, as gods. We, we are that way now. The ability to know secret things is one of the motivational principles and attractions behind all cults. All of the cults deal with mysteries. They deal with things that they think the average person doesn't know, but they have an esoteric knowledge. They have a special knowledge that other people don't know. Did you know that 1 John was written because of that kind of thing? There were people who believed that there was certain, a certain type of knowledge that you had to have to know God. And they wrote that Jesus Christ couldn't have been in the flesh because everything in the flesh is sinful. So John was inspired to write 1 John, and there he says the only knowledge you need is a knowledge that comes through faith in Christ. And he says Jesus Christ appeared in the flesh. The knowledge of the unknown, knowledge of mysteries, knowledge of secrets is power, but it's a power that only God Men can be like God. That's what the devil said. That's one of the arguments that Lucifer used in the Garden of Eden. In the day that you eat of the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God. You'll understand the secret of good and evil. A secret only God himself knows and understands. The only problem is men don't have the capacity to understand secrets because they belong only to God. I had a friend, I think I've told you this story before, he had some serious problems. And he sat down with another friend of his and he poured out his heart to his friend. And when, his, uh, when he finished confessing and talking and asked, asked his friend if he had any advice for him, his friend said, yes, I do. He said, what is it? He said, there's only one God, and you are not him. That's what he said. Only one God, and you are not him. My dear friends, we are limited in every area, and we must learn to leave the secret things with the Lord. I'm getting to a point here in just a moment. There's an infinite difference, of course, between men and God. If the Lord had revealed his secrets, there wouldn't be any need for faith. What can be understood does not require faith. Now I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I told you we would be going there, so I'd like you to turn over in your Bible to the book of Hebrews. 
chapter 11. And let's settle in here for just a few, a few minutes. I want you to listen to me this morning because I'm, try, I'm trying to be practical, practical. I have a lot of ground I want to cover, but I want you to understand what I'm trying to say in as far as I get with it. I want you to understand this. Let's forget all about the isms for a moment. You know what I mean by the ism? Let's forget about Arminianism. Let's forget about Socinianism. Let's forget about Arianism. Let's forget about Calvinism. Let's forget about, and let's just look at the Bible. Suppose you never heard any of those people. All you have is the Word of God. That's really the way we need to approach Scripture. The Scriptures indicate that the Lord is pleased when we trust him without reservation. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. The highest honor that we as human beings, as sinners, the highest honor we can give to our God, our Creator, our Savior, is to trust him. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, and look at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much you pray. It doesn't matter how many church services you go to. It doesn't matter how many good things you do. So many folks think, you know, if I do enough good things, the good things outweigh the bad things. It doesn't matter. Without, any, without faith in the Lord, without believing God, you can't please him. So the opposite side of that is what I just said. He is pleased when we trust him without reservation. Now, the second thing I want to say to you, it is, it is through faith. We talk about secret things now. It is through faith that we understand, not through observation and deduction or explanation. Now, here in Hebrews chapter 11, I'd like you to look right here at verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. First of all, it says we understand through faith. We don't understand spiritual things through the five senses. We don't understand spiritual things through logical deduction. This is true, and that's true, and this is true, therefore this must be true. If this is true, that must be true. No. I studied philosophy many, many years ago at Vanderbilt University, and I can tell you one of the greatest mistakes that philosophers made in history was trying to, quote, prove God by logical argument. God cannot be proven. He doesn't attempt to prove himself. The Bible doesn't believe. Now, let me make this reasonable for you to believe what I'm going to tell you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me give you a few reasons why you should believe that. It just begins with a declaration. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, in understanding spiritual things, we must understand through faith and not through the five senses, not through logical deduction. We don't figure it out. Then it says we understand. He says we perceive without the use of any of these five senses. You see that word, I don't know what translation you have, but this translation I have in verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed. Framed. That's a Greek term, uh, katotidzo, and it means created and joined together. It means arranged. 